So good morning, welcome back. Did everybody who uh, wanted to get off the waiting list get in? I had some email with the administrator about that yesterday. He said there were three people he couldn't let in because the fire marshal wouldn't let him because there's a number, limit to the number of people in this room, but then I reminded him that we had an overflow room, so I think it should be no problem. Um, so if you have an issue, just send me mail, but you should be all off the waiting list by now, I hope. So let me continue now with lecture two, and I'm going to summarize what we did back then and then give you a hint of what we're going to do next. And so last time what I did is I showed you some data, and as a scientist I have to show you the data, right? that even incredibly simple programs, like just reading through memory in a very simple pattern, can have very complicated behaviors. And very small changes in those programs can make the execution time vary by orders of magnitude. The takeaway for us is that we need to think, we can't go down to that level of detail all the time. You know, once was where we went. And we need a simpler mental model so that we can write programs that are very likely to run fast, right? So we have to have a simple model of all that complexity, even though that complexity is there. So then what we did is we said, okay, what are the lessons to draw about how do you generate algorithms and software that are likely to run fast? And so the mental model was all we need, to the, all the cost addition that made those behaviors so complex was accessing memory, was moving data between main memory and cache or between different levels of cache. And so what we want to do is organize our algorithms to minimize the number of accesses to memory. That's the most expensive thing these machines do by orders of magnitude. And we showed how to do that, in particular for matrix multiply, we showed a blocked algorithm that went very, very fast. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we even have a theorem which says we can do as, as well as possible. And in the, in the special case of that matrix multiply algorithm that I showed you, we, there's a theorem that goes back to 1981 that says no matter how you organize it, you have to, and so your big matrix does not fit in your little cache of size capital M, your n by n matrix, it only fits in your main memory, how much data movement has to occur, how many words do you have to move back and forth between the fast memory and the slow memory? That's the most expensive thing by far. And the answer is, no matter what you do, it's the dimension cubed, the number of floating point operations, divided by the square root of m, the square root of the cache size. And that algorithm I showed you had that property. I did the, did the counting, and that turns out to be optimal. So it turns out that this theorem isn't true just for matrix multiply. It's true much more broadly, um, and we'll come back to that later in the semester. So the next thing that we're going to do is, in the course of the semester, is think about, given that we now understand there are certain algorithms that run fast, how do we take our high-level application that we care about and decompose it into these pre-existing, well-known, well-understood algorithms so that, it's, and so that it will run fast? And in particular, it, for matrix multiply, somebody's already done a really good job of implementing it already, just to pick one example. How do I find the best library? How do I use it in the most effective way for my particular problem? So we'll spend a bunch of time on that. And of course, to make all of this work, there are a bunch of software tools that I'll be telling you about. How do I implement my algorithms and applications in the most efficient way and productive way. And remember, efficient means it runs as fast as possible once you get it written. And productive means it doesn't take very long to write it. You don't have to write assembly language. You're going to call high-level operations. So I've written these things in this funny order because those are layers. Those are the layers in which you want to think about writing your programs and into which they are decomposed as you start. So if you start with an application, it will be decomposed into algorithms. There'll be software tools underneath that, and eventually the hardware, the really messy stuff, is going to be at the bottom. And so you may personally like to think at one particular layer here, but all these layers exist. You'll probably be, you know, over the course of your career, you know, most knowledgeable and expert in one layer, but they're all there, and you, you, should, you need to know enough to use them. Okay, so let me tell you, go back to this story of algorithms. I told you that matrix multiply was one of those things that everybody agreed on was important. So let me give you the history. Uh, and in fact, it's so important that there's an industry standard. Everybody's agreed on the name of the subroutine that does matrix multiply. And no matter what computer you're on, there's a library with the same name and the same interface. You just call it. And there's a team of programmers somewhere in the world that has spent all their time optimizing it for that particular platform that you happen to be on. So this is true for basic linear algebra subroutines. It's certainly not true for all the algorithms we're going to talk about this semester. This is one of the most important ones, so it's well understood. It's called the BLAS, and here are the web pages for the reference implementations. And every time a computer vendor comes out with a new version of their hardware, they have a team of people who's tuning this stuff to make it run as fast as possible. 
Actually, sometimes we still beat them. That's another story. But they, they're working on it as hard as they can. Um, so here's the history of how that worked. So back in the 1970s, people realized the need for a standard set of libraries. And they invented the first version of the, blo <coughs> of the BLAS, the BLAS level one. And those are basically vector operations, so dot products, SACSPs, that means a scalar times a vector plus a vector, and things that you can do with one or two vectors. And because people wanted them. And they, they were you know, good enough for the sort of vector machines of the time. But let's, let's ask how successful they are in, in our metric of success today, which is minimizing communication. So let's look at a dot product of length n. So I'm going to do two, uh, I'm going to do n multiplies. I'm going to read the vector x, that's n words read, and read the vector y. So 2n is the number of words moved, m is the number of words moved. I'm going to do, how many floating point operations f of them I'm going to do? Well, n multiplies n adds. So the ratio of flops to amount of data, that's what we called the computational intensity last time, the bigger the better, is about 1. And it's even less for some of these other operations. So it was good enough at the time, but for us, we know that's, that's really bad. We're going to be totally dominated by memory. Then later, machines changed. People had to go back and revisit this. And the standards committee met again, and they agreed on something the Blas level 2, so the second version. And these were matrix vector operations. So matrix vector multiplying being the canonical one, but there are quite a few others. There's a list of like 15 or so subroutines uh, you know, solving triangular systems of equations. So now, if I'm doing a matrix vector multiply, I'm going to read in n squared matrix entries from memory, the n by n matrix. I'll do a multiply add for each of them, so two n squared opera uh, floating point operations, and my computational intensity has gone all the way from 1 to 2. And that's a good thing. Uh, but there's also a lot less overhead, right? There's one subroutine, and they can unroll it completely to do many, many floating point operations. So this was quite a bit faster. And at the time, that made people happy for the sort of vector machines of the day. Finally, people realized that wasn't good enough. The cost of communication was still you know, killing you because the computational intensity was only two. So they decided to go to the Blas level three. And these are like matrix multiply is a canonical example, but again, there's a list of a dozen or so different operations that smell like matrix multiply that they all agreed on that are in all these standard libraries. And so now, as I said, we're, we have three n squared matrix entries, you know, your A, B, and C, n by n matrices. I'm doing n cubed operations, so my computational intensity goes all the way up to n, if you're lucky. We know we can't get there. There's this theorem, but it's a lot better than it was before. And so this is what is in this standard library. There's another reason these are called Blas level 1, 2, and 3. If, you, if your input is of dimension n, this does, the Blas 1 does n to the 1 operations, Blas 2 does n squared operations in the data, and Blas 3 does n cubed operations on the data. So you can remember it that way just as well. And so when people had built this, they said, OK, let's go back and look at the higher level things that people really want to do, solve linear equations, least squares problems, eigenvalue problems, and let's rebuild them all so that they're not adding a row of a matrix of a, to, to another. They're not doing blahs one in the inner loop. They're doing matrix multiplies. And then these two libraries were made available. They're widely distributed. Again, the vendors all make them available. You know, we have the public domain versions that we've developed, but now everybody takes them and tunes them for their machines. And for a long time, people thought this was as good as you could get. You know, if, you, if inside of Gauss elimination, you call matrix multiply, and the matrix multiply is going as fast as possible, you're done. We now know we can do much better for all of them. That's a later lecture. But this is sort of, there's this industry standard. And so for linear algebra in particular, people try to make it available. So, uh, and, and there'll be a later lecture on, on you know, how you can do better than kind of the obvious way of doing it. But let me just show you why it's important to, go, to use BLAS3 when you can, and why BLAS2 is not as good, and BLAS1 is even worse. So here's some performance data. The horizontal axis is the matrix dimension. The vertical axis is the speed on this old machine. The dotted line is the peak, 266 megaflops. That gives you an idea of how old it is. This line is the BLAS3 speed, matrix multiply. And as the matrix gets big enough, you can see it's getting you know, well over 90% of peak. BLAS2 is down here, and, Bl and BLAS1 is right there, so you know, much smaller fractions. So you'd obviously rather organize your algorithm to spend all its time doing BLAS3 in instead of BLAS2 or BLAS1. And so this is one particular machine. Here's another piece of data to show you that it's true very broadly. So each of these uh, pairs of columns is a different processor. And the blue line and the vertical axis is speed, so up is good. 
the blue line is the speed of matrix multiply, dgem is the name of it, and the red line is the speed of matrix vector multiply, dgem v is what it's called. And you can see no matter what platform you're on, matrix multiply goes a large multiple of the speed of matrix vector multiply. Now, this benchmark is just for large square matrices, but you know, it, it, you know, your performance improvement may vary depending on the size. In particular, if everything is so small that it fits in cache, so that you, know, you don't have that any, much matrix move, uh, data movement for either of these, it's the same amount, the whole thing fits in cache, they'll run at about the same speed. But once it gets big enough that it doesn't fit in cache, then you see these big differences. Question, and let me ask that you speak in the mic. We should make sure the mic's on. So presumably people were doing matrix vector multiplies before BLAS2 existed, you know, in the 70s. Is it just that and they it wrote was their never own two nested loops? They, they just did two nested loops? Okay. Right, right. But, and, but there, so let me just give you an example of why industry would standardize on it. I'll have some more examples later. Is that, you know, if you're on a special processor like a vector machine, you may have special hardware instructions that are really good at doing a lot of multiplies and adds at the same time. You don't want the user to have to write assembly language. You'll write that yourself. But just to name an even simpler one, a dot product. So suppose, or let's say the two norm of a vector, so the root sum squares of the entries of one vector, right? So, so that's an incredibly simple thing, but let me, so the simplest code you can imagine writing is, you know, sum up the sums of squares and then take the square root. That's, that's wrong. So that fails a, a significant fraction of the time, and can you see why? So imagine that one number in your vector is bigger than the square root of the overflow threshold, the largest floating point number that's permitted on the machine. When you square that number, you either you know, crash or get an infinity or something like that, and it doesn't work, even though the vector has a perfectly well-defined length. And the same thing can go wrong if it's all too small. And so to get all those details right, they want to just put it in the library and do it well once, and, not, and so the users don't have to worry about all those details. So there, there's a whole bunch of things like that in there, too. Any other questions? Okay. So, so that's, so now let me go on and say the algorithm that I gave you for matrix multiply that was optimal, I claimed, is, was only optimal when you have two layers of memory hierarchy. You have fast memory and slow memory. And I showed you if you picked the block sizes right in that algorithm, remember because I had to break up my matrix into little b by b blocks, and I picked that block size so that I could fit th exactly three of those b, b, b by b blocks into my cache. And so to do that, that, that only made sense if I had one level of fast, fast memory and I knew how big it was, then I could write that code. But real hardware doesn't just have one level of, of cache. It had, might have L1 cache, which is very small and fast, and then it has L2 cache, which is bigger and slower, L3 cache, DRAM, disk. You can have an arbitrary number of layers. And so let's just imagine what would be necessary to write that fast matrix multiplier, fast anything else, if we had a machine like that. What would be required? So if I, so the one level of memory, the naive code, that's your basic three nested loops. The two levels of memory, that's what I showed you last time. And what did the code look like? I had three outer loops, which were looping over blocks. And then the three inner loops multiplied a block of A times a block of B times a block of C. So when you, if you write it all out completely, you actually had six nested loops. So I, when I wrote the code on the board, my inner loop was block of A times block of B. I didn't actually write out the three innermost nested loops. But now let's suppose I had not just two levels of memory, but three. I'd have to do the blocking again. I'd have nine nested loops. And then you, know, you can imagine the complexity goes on. And, for, and for each, to get each of these loop nests right, I have to know how big every level of the cache is. So this gets quite tedious, and this is why there are teams of programmers at the different vendors. But it turns out there's an alternative way to do it that works, and it's oblivious to the cache size, and it's oblivious to how many levels of cache there are. And it still, you know, in theory, asymptotically, optimizes the communication no matter how many levels you have. So what I'm going to do, and I'll show you how to do it for matrix multiply, and later for some other different algorithms. I'm going to treat matrix multiply. I'm going to break it down into a set of smaller problems. Now, I keep breaking it in half, basically. So I'll take my n by n matrix multiply and, and turn it into a bunch of multiplies of problems half the size. I do that recursively. Eventually, those will fit in cache, no matter what sizes the cache are. 
And so, and I'll write down a very simple formula that proves that in theory it does actually minimize the traffic. And these are called cache oblivious because they're oblivious to the number and levels of caches. So here's the algorithm. It's very simple. It fits on one slide. Let me write down what it, the complete formula for multiplying two two by two matrices. So here it is in all its glory. I want to multiply A times B. And so what is the 1-1 one, one entry? It's A11 one, one times B11 one, one and so forth. So there it all is. So it turns out that this formula is true whether C is a two by two matrix, and so all of these things are scalars, or if this is an n by n matrix, and all of these submatrices are n over two by n over two matrices. This formula is still true. So what does this mean? This is now an n over two matrix times an n over two matrix plus an n over two matrix times an n over two matrix. The algebra is, works, right? You can try it yourself. And so this tells us how to take a problem of size n by n and break it into a bunch of smaller problems. So how many smaller problems are there? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight smaller half-size matrix multiplies. So let me write down the algorithm. And if you haven't seen a recursive algorithm before, here it is. This RMM stands for recursive matrix, mul matrix multiply. And you can see it calls itself as a subroutine. That's, you know, a common, th you know, that's a familiar thing if, if you've had certain kinds of programming experience, but if not, it's perfectly legal. So here's the idea. I'm going to call matrix multiply on A times B of dimension N. If it, they're all one by one, if they're scalars, I just do it and I'm finished. Otherwise, I do the eight different half-size matrix multiplies that are up here, and then, of course, I have to add them, right? So this returns the product of these two n over 2 by n over 2 matrices, and I get an n over 2 by n over 2 matrix, and then I sum it with that one, and I get the four, four, four sum n's. And so I've shown it here, and this code is correct, when n is a power of 2, so it obviously works when n equals 16 or 32, everything divides evenly, but it extends to the general rectangular case. I just have to be careful about what it means to divide by 2. But let's just think about the square case. So I claim that this code does exactly as many arithmetic operations as the usual three nested loops. And I also claim it optimizes the amount of memory traffic. And, it do, and, and it's completely oblivious to the size of the cache, right? That doesn't appear anywhere here. There's no cache size. So let me just show you. It's, it's like basically it all fits on one slide. So here is the code again. And what I want to do is write down two recurrences, a formula, for the number of arithmetic operations and for the number of memory moves. So how about the number of arithmetic operations done by this? Well, how many, so uh, since this is a recursive function, I'm going to get a recursive formula. I'm going to get a recurrence that I need to solve. So the number of, uh, the number of operations to multiply n by n matrices, well, I call this subroutine eight times, so there's an eight, on problems of half the size, so it's eight times a of n over 2. And then I have all of these additions, and each of these are adding n over 2 by n over 2 matrices, so each of those costs me n over 2 squared additions, and they're four of them. And so there's a nice simple recurrence, and if you're familiar with solving recurrences, you just can sort of work it out. It's a geometric sum, and the answer is 2n cubed. You're doing exactly the same operations the normal three nested loops do. You're just doing them in a different order, but who cares, right? Addition is associative, so you're allowed to do that. So what about the amount of memory traffic? So I'm going to write down a recurrence there again. So this is the number of words moved between fast and slow memory by this, by this subroutine for when I call it on a problem of size n by n. And I'm going to use m sub fast to be the size of the fast memory. OK, so that's a constant. m is a function. So again, I'm going to call this function eight times. So it's certainly going to do eight times as much memory traffic as calling the subroutine on a problem of half the size. But now I also have the issue of I've got to take, read that matrix from memory, read that one, add them, and put it back. So I still I have some extra stuff. And roughly that's, a, again, proportional to n squared. So I have four of these you know, n squared kinds of things. I may have gotten the constant wrong, but it doesn't matter. OK, so this is basically the same formula as before. And that keeps on going and keeps on going, but eventually it stops. That's why I get a different answer for m than a. This recurrence keeps on going until the, these matrices are so small they fit in cache. Then this formula just stops, because when everything fits in cache, I just read them in, and then there's no more memory traffic. 
And so this recurrence is true only if the three matrices don't fit in cache. Once they do, it stops, and I read them in once, do 3n squared, and then that's it. So the recurrence stops early. And now I can write down the same recurrence formula, and it's n cubed over the square root of the cache size. And I didn't have to know the cache size to write down the algorithm just to do the analysis. And so that's why these are called cache oblivious. And if I had multiple levels of caches, you know, L1 and L2, I would just say this theorem tells me I'm minimizing everything. I'm minimizing the traffic, you know, traffic into L1. I'm minimizing the traffic into L2. It tells me everything I need to know. So this sort of seems like magic, uh, and it solves all our problems. It's not quite. Um, so in practice, if you actually ran this and did recursion down to one by one, there's just too much overhead in all these subroutines calls on one by one matrices and stuff like that. So in practice, you cut it off at some level when it fits in like the smallest cache, the L1, and you call a little you know, three nested loop kind of thing that works on eight by eight or 64 by 64 matrices. So you have to know a little bit about the hardware to get it to run fast, and the people do that. Um, so you gotta make sure you get that little micro kernel, your 64 by 64 matrix multiply done very well. And so there was uh, some, a uh, bunch of people have been studying this for a long time because it's you know, a very intellectually attractive thing to do and it, it often works. And um, as of this 2006 report, um, they never quite got you know, the full speed right, compared to what you could do by hand, but they got maybe two-thirds of the peak. Right? But they still got most of the mileage from doing it. So that means that for matrix multiply, you probably may not do this necessarily. But for a lot of other algorithms where you don't have a team of people doing it all by hand, you might be extremely happy with two-thirds of peak. And so it's available for lots of other things. And so, but let me say that we've been redoing this kind of work in the parallel case. I've talked about sequential so far. And uh, there's some joint work with two people in the front row, and we'll hear about it later where we've been using this in the parallel case to minimize communication. And in that case, we're actually beating the vendor's code by large margins because they didn't do it all right, okay? So we'll come back to this karma communication avoiding recursive matrix multiply algorithm later when we talk about the parallel case. But, but you know, because you can do this uh, oblivious stuff there as well. Okay, so let me move on to um, another issue with these algorithms if you really want to minimize communication. And that is that you have to change the data layouts. So um, in addition to minimizing how much memory traffic, you know, the number, counting the number of words and making that be as small as possible, what, you, what hardware also punishes you for doing is going to memory and getting words that are sort of spread out all over the place. It really is optimized if all your words are in one contiguous chunk of memory, you can grab them in one chunk. Maybe the easiest way to think about that is think about how a disk works. So a disk is spinning, and you want to grab a bunch of words. How long does that take? You have to pick up the read head, move it a little bit, put it down on, on top, close to somewhere in the disk. That takes a while. And then it spins, and you can read the words that are spinning under the, un, under the read head. So it takes a long time to get the read head where you want it, and then it starts spinning fast. And as long as you want all the words that are right next to one another on that circle that's spinning under the disk, you get them all fast. But if they were spread out everywhere, you'd be taking a very, very long time. So it's easy to understand from the physics of a spinning disk why you'd like all your data to be in one contiguous chunk. It's true for other kinds of hardware, too. And the trouble is that for the standard way you store matrices, that's not true. I mean, a, if you store a matrix by columns and you want a whole column, yeah, that's all stored side by side. But what if you want a row, right? They're all stored by big jumps in between them. And we saw last time, you know, all those complicated pictures, that's very expensive. So it, we, what we'd like is a different way to store matrices and, and other data structures that we come up with during the semester where you can grab any chunk of it and it's always, almost always stored in one chunk. And if, you've ever, if, you ever, if you were a math major and you took a course in analysis and learned about space filling curves, then the idea is based on this thing called space filling curves. So here is the picture. So here's my matrix that I'd like to store in a way that I can grab any sort of square subblock, and it's almost always packed together. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take the northwest corner, store that all packed together, then the northeast corner, then the southwest corner, and then the southeast corner. So it's sort of the Z pattern. So all of these guys will be together, then these guys, then these guys, then these guys. So what do I do inside here? Well, I'm going to use the same idea recursively. I'll store everything in its northwest corner, then the northeast, then the north, 
then the southwest, and then the southeast. And I'll keep on doing that recursively. So now, if I actually do want a square subblock, let's say that one, that one will be stored all together in memory. So what if I want, let's say, this square subblock, which isn't exactly lined up? Well, now it'll take me at most four chunks that are contiguous in memory to be able to grab it all. You know, it doesn't depend on the dimension. It's just a nice, simple number four. So this is called Morton ordering, after somebody who invented it. And it's called Z-Morton ordering. You can imagine there's also C and various other flavors of Morton ordering, N and whatever, Morton ordering. They all have been used. And so here's a very good survey article from 2004 where people got very good speed ups by reorganizing algorithms, a whole bunch of algorithms to use this particular format. Um, and again, this works no matter what your cache sizes are, right? This is, again, oblivious to cache sizes, which is why it's attractive. Again, you probably don't want to go down to one by one, right? You'll break it off at some point. So what are the disadvantages? Is that, you know, if somebody just says, please go get a sub i j, where do you go, right? There's this sort of complicated algebra that you have to do to figure out where it actually is in memory. And so it makes coding a little bit, you know, painful. And if you're going to you know, pick out random matrix entries, it's not a very pleasant thing to do. And so <clears throat> what people do is in, when the problems fit in cache, uh, when this block is small enough to fit in cache, they just go back to column major or row major. And needless to say, users do not like this kind of data structure, right? Imagine if you had to reorganize your matrix so it looked like that before you called your matrix multiply routine. And so what people do in practice when they use this is that they do something called copy optimization. I'll tell you about it later. They take your column-oriented ma matrix, that's your input, they copy it so it looks like this, and then they do all the work, and then they copy the answer back to your format that you like. And the extra cost of copying is, you know, might be very small compared to the, how much faster the matrix multiply goes. So, so this is another example of what people do. Okay. So again, not just for matrix multiply, but for many other things and many other data structures. So let me, so questions are always welcome. So the trick that I showed you back here about recursive algorithms, where I broke it up into eight problems of half the size, also gives us an opportunity, if you just think that way, to do less than n cubed operations. And so here is a recursive algorithm that doesn't do n cubed operations. It only does n to the 2.81 operations in order to multiply matrices. Now, where does 2.81 come from? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. So, so, let's, so here is my 2 by 2 matrix multiply. And so I want to multiply these matrices and get those four numbers. And so it turns out that I only need to do seven multiplies to do it. And here's the trick. I'm going to take these linear combinations, sums and differences of these entries of that matrix, compute these seven products, I'll call them P1 through P7, and then if I take these particular linear combinations of those products, all the intermediate terms that I don't want cancel and I just get the true entries of my product matrix. So here I can, I'm doing, if you count it all, there's either 15 or 18 additions, that sounds like a bad idea, but I'm only doing seven multiplies. And so the question is, why would I ever want to do this Certainly not for two by two matrices, but let's see what benefit it gives me on big matrices, right? Because I want to use this recursively. I want to use this where this is not a two by two matrix, but an n by n matrix. And so I'm only doing seven problems of half the size. So here is the formula. It's the same kind of recurrence I had before. It's the timed or the number of uh, multiplies to multiply n by n matrices using this formula. What does it cost? I'm going to do seven multiplies of problems of half the size. So I had an 8 before, now it turned into a 7. And I'm doing 18 additions, right? That looks like a bad idea. But if I do the, if I just uh, you know, write this out, I get a geometric sum. It's now n to the log base 2 of 7. The old formula where the 8 was n to the log base 2 of 8. That's n cubed. Now it's n to the log base 2 of 7, and that's where 2.81 comes from. So this is arbitrarily faster than the matrix multiply I showed you before, the classical one. Uh, the larger n gets, the, the smaller n to the 2.81 is compared to n cubed. And of course, the crossover depends on the machine. And people have tried tuning this for quite a while. And it's natural to ask, well, how much uh, memory movement is there? It's wonderful that I'm do actually doing less arithmetic. But how about the expensive part, which is moving data between fast memory and cache, uh, fast memory and slow memory, slow memory and cache, let me say that right, 
it turns out that there's a theorem that, that we developed, and we extended these lower bounds that say, no matter how you implement this particular matrix multiply, as long as you do those n to the log base 2 of 7 operations and the usual additions, then the number of words moved between fast and slow memory is bounded below by some constant multiple. That's what big omega means, bounded below by some constant multiple of the number of floating point operations, n to the 2.81. And in the bottom, it's not m to the 1 half anymore. That's what it used to be. It's m to the, well, log base 2 of 7 divided by 2 minus 1. So m to the 0.4, roughly. So again, it's a lot lower than it was before. And I'm pleased to say this won a best paper prize uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, it's attainable. And we'll talk about this more uh, when we talk about parallel matrix multiply in the semester, because this is actually the fastest known algorithm. It beats all the vendors' uh, algorithms for doing matrix multiply in parallel. So it's sort of an interesting example, but we'll come back to it. Question. So I, pr I probably should know this, but what does Strassen do? Can you remind me? So Strassen's algorithm, here it is. Oh, right. So okay. it's, going to, it's going to look like recursive matrix multiply, and it will call itself recursively. It'll form these, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different sums and differences of matrices. And it'll call itself recursively to do those seven multiplies. And then it'll do those, you know, additions to get the final answer. So it'll look very similar to this code, except instead of eight recursive calls, I'll have seven. But very, very similar. And, yeah, okay. So we, and we will talk about what the, uh, how it attains the lower bound and all of that in a later lecture. So um, the people, when Strassen first did this in the 1960s, people were amazed that something like matrix multiply could go faster. And that set off a race, which continues to this day. And so for many, many years, the world's record for was, you know, people tried to, what do I mean by race? They tried to make the exponent lower and lower, you know, as, as close to two as you can get, right? You're not going to get smaller than two. And for many, many years, the world's record was 2.376, which was set by... A very complicated algorithm, I'm not going to tell you about it, by Coppersmith and Winograd in 1987. And I'm very pleased to say there's a new world record as of two years ago by a Berkeley postdoc, uh, Virginia Williams. I was, uh, had the honor of being in the seminar when she announced her result. She got 2.376 all the way down to 2.373. Okay. <laughs> so this is a new world's record, and it has stood since uh, fall 2011. And so uh, that's good news, although you, know, you can see that people are very passionate about uh, trying to make this as, as small as possible. Whether it's practical or not, I'll, I'll say later. Question. So if the matrix are not uh, uh, perfectly square matrices, uh, what will the algorithm so, do? So the, the simplest answer to the question of what to do about non-square matrices is make them big and square and pad them with zeros. <laughs> And then just multiply those and take out your answer. And if all you're interested in is in the theory and you don't care about the constant hidden in the big O, then that's all you need to do, right? So in practice, that's not what you should do, right? So, so the, the actual practical applications of this, well, you've got to get all the constants right. Those, those certainly matter. But all this, this slide is all about big O notation. Okay. So, um, so let me say that so that's where the world record currently sits. The lower bound that I told you about and how many words move, uh, have to move between fast memory and slow memory, can be extended to some of these algorithms. So it's the, the lower bound is n to this power divided by m to some other power. And so that can be extended, not necessarily to all of them. Um, there is the possibility, people have held open the possibility of an n to the 2 plus epsilon algorithm. You know, you can, in other words, not quite n squared, but a little bit better than n squared. And there was this beautiful paper written in 2003 where these folks reduced it to a problem in group theory. If they can find the right kind of group with certain kinds of decomposition properties, then that will yield an algorithm with this. But you know, nobody's found that particular group yet. So that's, that's a, an interesting theoretical question. So one thing that people objected to for many years about all these algorithms is that, you know, in theory, they're faster, but do they get the right answer? And, and so let me say why you would worry about that. Because they're not doing the usual n-cubed operations. They're making different round-off errors, right? Because when you do floating point arithmetic, you don't get the exact answer. And people were saying, well, the answers aren't, you know, how can I trust the answer? Is it as good as the usual algorithm with the usual floating point error bounds? And it is possible to show they can also all be made numerically stable. 
you know, the constants are maybe a little bit worse, but in principle, they are all numerically stable. And in fact, you can do the rest of linear algebra just as fast and just as stably by using this, these matrix multiplies as building blocks inside Gaussian elimination. So the inner loop of Gaussian elimination won't you know, add a, a one row of a matrix to another row. It's going to do some matrix multiplies. And if you use these, those can all, in principle, run just as fast. Um, whether that's practical or not remains to be seen. And let me just say that the general rule for these, the, the common wisdom, is that Strassen works. It gets, you know, it's accurate enough. You know, it goes faster in practice, but it may need unrealistic. But the other algorithms, you know, and they have to be so large because of the constant hidden that big O that it's not necessarily very practical. It remains to be seen. But Strassen is real. The other ones are not. So let me say that one reason Strassen is not in everybody's library is interesting because the top 500 list, where everybody races their supercomputers every six months to see who's fastest, they spend all their time doing matrix multiply in the inner loop of Gaussian elimination. They're forbidden from using Strassen. And, and the reason is that people wouldn't know how to compare two different algorithms if they weren't all you know, knowingly doing n cubed operations. They wouldn't be able to measure the speed. And just to make the benchmark easier, they forbid Strassen. Too bad. So, but that's, that's, uh, that's the current state. OK, any questions about matrix multiply and, and the blahs before I move on? So I want to give you some hints about tuning code. Uh, this is sort of you know, hints that might be useful for homework number one. And so this is something you're going to do you know, at a low level just for this first homework. And then later, it's entirely up to you how much time you want to spend on this. So there's a lot of code variations that you can imagine trying. I've shown you some, a number of different ways of writing code. But choosing block sizes, how you exactly write the inner loops, there's an enormous number of variations. And the compiler behavior can be hard to predict. And so what this resulted in, in the community, was a response called auto-tuning. Human beings have better things to do than try all the different possibilities and run them and see what happens. So let the computer do it. Let the computer automatically generate all the possible different ways of organizing your loops, picking the block sizes, you know, generating the code, and search them for the fastest one. I mean, that's, computers are good at that kind of automatic stuff. And so this activity started with a homework assignment in this class, the next one you're about to do. Uh, back in the mid-'90s, you know, up until that point, the students had raced, the, as you will, the vendor's hand-tuned matrix multiply algorithm, and nobody had ever gotten close to it. Except that one year, there were several students who beat the hand-tuned code from the vendor. And that got the teaching assistants, uh, including Krista Isanovich, who's now a faculty member here, so interested, how could the students beat the hand-tuned code, that they took all of the students' code apart and tried to see what they did and built the first auto-tuner just as an experiment. Je they tried all those different optimizations, and that created a project called Feepack, which was successful in very systematically beating the vendor's code. And that led to a number of other projects. And now it's sort of a big research area where people try to do automatic tuning, not just for matrix multiply, but for many, many different algorithms. So later in the semester, I'll talk about FFTs. That's another incredibly popular kind of kernel. There have been, on the order of 100 papers written on how to do divide and conquer FFT. It's not just the one you may have heard about in you know, the standard way by Cooley Tukey. And so what people have done is they've built an auto-tuner which, which knows about all 100 papers. Right? It has all 100 different ways of doing divide and conquer at every step, and they try them all. And they hand you, for your particular machine and your particular dimension of your FFT, the optimal code. So this is, you know, and this is autom automated, right? You don't want to do this by hand. So we'll hear more about that later. So um, you uh, may want to actually write a very primitive auto-tuner in some high-level language for your first assignment. People have done that in the past. You do not have to. But it's something that's, you know, that you could imagine doing if you're ambitious. So let me tell you about what this search space looks like. So one thing is to try all the block sizes. I told you that you know, it's, you, the inner three inner loops multiply b by b submatrices of a times b to get c, little b by little b. And I suggested that the right way to choose b was it should be as big as possible so that all three submatrices fit in cache. So three times little b squared should be less than the cache size. But in practice, it's a lot messier. And people have tried to build models to pick the optimal one. But let me show you what the real search space looks like and why it's very hard to model. So I'm going to show you some data, some search data, where we tried all the different possible block sizes for, uh, you know, just for uh, a very small uh, matrix. 
and, try, and measured each one and tried to see how fast it went and show you how irregular it looks. So here is a slice through the search space. This was for register blocking on a machine with 16 registers. So I could only, so my, t my fast memory was of size 16. So I had to pick three tiny little submatrices that I was going to multiply, and they all had to fit in registers in order to do the work. And so I chose here, so, the, so, the, so here are the sizes. So it was, I'm multiplying an n0 by m0 block times an m0 by k0 block to get an n0 by k0 submatrix, right? So it's, those are the block sizes. And since I only have 16 registers, it's, no worth, it's not worth looking at any problems bigger than 16. And it's not worth looking at any problem of bigger where n times m is bigger than 16, because that submatrix has to fit in all, all the registers. So I didn't even look out there. And I tried every other possibility. So, you know, so 4 by 1 and, you know, and, and 2 by 7, all those fit in 16. And I tried every one of them. And I color coded it by how fast it went. So, from, you know, so dark blue is not very fast at all. And bright red is the fastest one. And the winner is 4 by 2. Why? I don't know. It's just some complicated, you know, messy interaction with all of the way code is generated and, and what can be done and, you know, overlapped in the hardware. And this is what computers should do. They should spend their time finding that particular point, not, not human beings. So 4 by 2 was the actual optimal block size for this particular machine. And um, so let me show you. So this was, you know, just one particular example. What's the result of doing this auto-tuning? Let me show you results in now lots of machines. So the horizontal axis is many, many different platforms. The vertical axis is megaflop, so up is good. And for each machine, I'm showing you three different benchmarks, three different speeds of matrix multiply. I'm showing the vendor blahs, the hand-tuned stuff from the vendor in red. The atlas, um, the auto-tuned stuff, atlas is the name of the auto-tuner, that's in blue. And then if you write the naive three nested loops, that's the brown. And so in all these cases, you can see that you, know, you don't want to use the three nested loops. That's pretty slow. And the auto-tuner, auto-tune code, the blue stuff, is almost always about as fast and sometimes even faster than what came out of the vendor for this particular you know, big square matrix. And so this is a, oh, this was 500 by 500 matrix multiply. So this is just to show you that it's a useful thing to do. So question? So I noticed in one of them, the vendor is actually faster, or maybe two of them. Wouldn't the vendor code be one of the things Atlas tries anyway? So, so um, to, to make this a comparison fair, um, Atlas has, only has its own sort of internal search space with all the different block sizes and ways of organizing loops and compiler flags. It tries different compiler flags. So yes, the vendor is another possibility. I should add that some compilers have a flag minus matmul. And, and so that's when you, you know you, you want to compile a subroutine that's matrix multiply. You tell the compiler, you know, don't even bother looking at the code. I'm just telling you it's matrix multiply. Call the vendor. Right? That's, <laughs> that's a cheating flag. But it's in there because sometimes people want it. Right? So this is not doing that. <laughs> okay, and any other questions? OK. So here's the kind of search space that these auto-tuners look over or that you might choose to look over some subset of these for your first homework assignment. There's tiling for registers, which is what I showed you there. That was that sort of you know, heat chart with lots of bright colors. And in that case, since it was only, I'm only doing at most 16 operations, you, you're not going to actually have loops. It's going to be completely unrolled. You're going to have just a sequence of all of the addition and multiply statements. Then, of course, there's all the block sizes for all the other levels of cache and the TLB, the translation look aside buffer, which worries about uh, virtual memory. Then there's the issue of how do you generate code because there's hardware built into the machine. This is some of the complexity I talked about last time. So you may have superscalar architectures which can do you know, multiple adds and multiplies at the same time. You can pipeline stuff. You have complicated compiler interactions. It's not just the minus matmul flag. There's minus 03, minus 02. You, you can tell the compiler to try all sorts of different combinations of optimizations it knows about. And sometimes it's good at it, and sometimes it isn't. And here are just some examples <clears throat> of references to where people have done auto-tuning before if you want to look for more hints. So let me give you some examples of code rewriting that you might uh, consider trying. So here's your source code. And, so, and it looks fairly straightforward. You have an array A and array B. And it looks quite reasonable that you could do both of these at the same time. You know, this line of code is independent of that line of code. 
But the compiler doesn't know that. Can you see why the compiler may not know that it could do both these at the same time? The compiler does not know th that your array A and your array B do not overlap. It doesn't know that uh, A sub i is not equal to B sub i plus 1. In other words, it, it may think, I have to do this uh, line of code first and finish it, because I may need that value of A sub i may just happen to be equal to B sub i plus 1. It may be the same place in memory, because you could have called the subroutine with A and B kind of just the same array shifted by 1. You almost certainly didn't write your code that way. But you know that. The compiler doesn't. And so how do you tell the compiler, no, 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 these are two completely independent lines of code? Well, one way to do it is to, say, is to declare uh, that this is one floating point number, that's a different floating point number, they have nothing to do with one another, and then write it this way. That is a strong hint to the compiler that you know, these can be done at the same time. And with some compilers, there's actually extra flags where you can say that A and B are not alias. Then that means they cannot overlap. Some compilers have those flags and some don't. And depending on the language in the compiler, there's restrict pointers, pragmas, there's all this different stuff that different compiler writers build. So, so here's another example that has, comes up when you compute a convolution. So here's a very simple loop. You have an input array of some length uh, called the signal. And then you have three scalars who, in an array called filter. And what you want to do is take you know, the linear combination of every three consecutive signals with, this, with these filters and come out with an array of answers, right? So this is written in C. It would be easy enough to write in Fortran. So, so, you know, so for example, the first result is, is uh, every result is a linear combination, a dot product of these three numbers and three different consecutive entries of the signal array. So it's pretty natural. So these are really constants, even though you know, I'm referencing them as rays. You want the compiler to know that in the inner loop, these are constants. It doesn't have to go keep going to memory to get them anymore. So it's, we'll use the same trick. We'll declare these three things to be constant values. We only get them once. And now the compiler knows for sure that these can be kept in registers in the inner loop. There's no more memory traffic associated with getting f, just the signal. But that's not all that we can do to make this go faster. Uh, so here's another way to uh, you know, tell the compiler for sure this is, you know, keep it in a register. You know, there's no reason you should ever overwrite that. So that's an, this is a kind of a, an instruction that some compilers let you use. So, but here's another way to make it go even faster. So what I've done is I've taken these, this loop and I've unrolled it. That means I've written out three consecutive iterations in the innermost loop. So for the result 1, re result 0, result 1, and result 2. And then I increment it, so the next time through I'll do 3, 4, 5, the next time I'll do uh, 6, 7, 8, and so I, you know, every loop body is going to do three consecutive results. So why is this useful? So imagine here I'm starting, I get to the beginning of the loop, what can I do in parallel? Well, um, I, I need to go get S0, but S1 and S2 are still left over from the last time I was in the loop. So since I have S1 and S2, that means that I can do this guy, I can do that multiply, I can do that multiply, and I can do that add while I'm waiting for S0. So I can overlap communication. The compiler can overlap communication and computation by having you, because you wrote it this way. It'll be smart enough to do that automatically in the hardware. So, so now S0 finally arrives. What can I do? Um, I can do then F2 times F0. Um, I can do F1 times F0. I can do that line of code. And I can do F0 times S0. So I can look ahead. The compiler can look ahead and do all those three operations at the same time while it's waiting for S1 to arrive. Once S1 arrives, then I can go ahead and do that operation and that operation. And then finally, when S2 arrives, I can do that one. So the compiler knows in what order things are going to happen if you write the code this way. And it can schedule things automatically for you. And this can go significantly faster by unrolling. Again, you only have to do this in homework one. Just, or give it a try. Consider doing it in homework one. So here's another example of small changes to the code. Um, so suppose you have uh, a machine that has both a multiplier and an adder that can run in parallel. Right? It can do one multiply and one add at a time, but that's it. Then this seems like a good way to write it, because it will say, oh, I can do that and that. I'll schedule them both at the same time. And then I'll do that and I'll do that. But what if you had a multiplier that could do two multiplies at the same time, 
and an adder that could do two adds at the same time. How would you want to tell the compiler to do that? You might put the two multiply operations first, followed by the two additions to give it a hint that these two multiplies can happen at the same time. They can run in parallel, followed by the two additions. So it isn't clear what the right order to write these four lines of code is in. So an auto-tuner would just try all the permutations. And some of them might run faster than others. And again, that's something that you could do by hand, or the auto-tuner would do automatically for you. Try all the different combinations and permutations. So here's that copy optimization I was telling you about. So suppose I want to multiply you know, a two by two sub, my inner loop is going to multiply a two by two submatrix of A times a two by two submatrix of B. I would really like all of these to be stored in consecutive memory locations. And so what the compiler can do, what you, what you can do, actually, I should say, is take your input, copy it so it's in, it's in these blocks. This whole column is, 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 is stored this way. Well, so instead of having a whole column stored consecutively, 0th entry, 1st entry, 2nd entry, 3rd entry, reorganize the data so this block is all consecutive, 0, 1, 2, 3, so those all are consecutive memory locations. And similarly for all the others. It's that Morton ordering I had for you before, and that might also make the code run a lot faster. And I should say that Atlas does this, all of these optimizations, including this one, are included in Atlas. So it tries all these, you know, and with and without. Okay. So just to remind you of, you know, why we're doing all this, for any algorithm, not just matrix multiply, the performance is going to be limited by its computational intensity. And because that's going to tell us how much time we're going to spend doing memory traffic versus doing arithmetic. And how do we compute that? I'm just reminding you the definition. I count the number of arithmetic operations. I divide it by the number of words moved. And that had better be large. So I can hide the cost of memory traffic by doing a lot of arithmetic. And in matrix multiply, I had to change the, I, I had to not do the usual n cube loops. Uh, this could be as large as n. The three nested loops didn't do that. So I had to change the computation order. And that increased the locality. You know, so once I brought data into memory, I used it over and over again. In fact, I used it the square root of the cache size times. And so how to do this is, an open, is, is well understood for matrix multiply and some other linear algebra algorithms. But it's an open problem for a large number of those dwarfs that I was telling you about. And so there's many possible class projects that I will allude to over the semester where you could you know, take one of those other algorithms that we will learn about and say, well, how close does it come to attaining a lower bound? You know, how much memory traffic does it do? So there's lots of ways to make contributions. You know, and you know, so part of you know, what you should take away is that some problems are solved, matrix multiply perhaps, um, but some problems are wide open, and it would be great to make progress on them. OK, to summarize lecture two, um, the details of the machine, all that stuff I told you about last time, are very important for performance. And so, uh, in particular, you can lose a lot of the performance w even before you paralyze it. Just the performance on a single processor can be terrible. You know, the average program runs at 10% of peak, and that's because you're spending all your time moving data between fast memory and slow memory. And I showed you, um, you, know, it's, you know, I dive down to the very bottom to measure all that for you. But the takeaway, the simple model is just stop moving data if, to the extent possible. I also told you that there's a lot of hidden parallelism that the hardware tries to make happen for you automatically, pipelining SIMD instructions where it does multiple multiplies and adds at the same time, even on a, sequential, a supposedly sequential pro, a processor. I talked about memory hierarchies, uh, you know, so L1 cache, L2 cache, L3, DRAM, disk. Every time you go from one level to another, you get a much larger memory, but a much slower memory. And it can be hundreds of cycles to get to main memory. So uh, you don't want to do that very often. And so what you want to do is reorganize your algorithms to exploit locality, which means you're going to reuse data that you recently used. So it's, you, you bring it into fast memory, use it as many times as you can get away with. That's called temporal locality. And there's also spatial locality, because what the hardware does when you say, please get me this word, it gets not just that word, but all its neighbors. It grabs them all in one big chunk, often called a cache line. And so it would be really great if your algorithm used not just that one word, but all its neighbors. And that's called spatial locality. And so we you know, did the details of how to rearrange one algorithm to minimize memory traffic, but we will revisit that as time goes on. 
So that's the end of lecture two. Are there any questions before I go on to lecture three? I just wanted to spend a little bit on logistics, a minute. So homework zero is posted on the website. And all I'm asking you to do is you know, pick some application that you would like to run in parallel or some, you know, anything that has to do with parallelism and build, write a little tiny essay about it and post it on the website. And that's due February 7th. It could be your intended class project. It could be anything that you're interested in. Part of this is so that you can get to know, I can get to know you and what your background is. But it's also so that your fellow students, because I hope you, you'll permit us all to make these visible, so you can find potential partners. You know, if two of you were both interested in parallelizing the same application, this is a good way to find out. Then you could be team members on the final project. Uh, speaking of getting to know you better, the class survey is posted. Uh, please fill it out. Um, this is so we can figure out your background, because we want to do this to assign interdisciplinary teams for homework one. So computer scientists and non-computer scientists, so that you know, everybody is, you know, all the teams are you know, on a level playing field and can go up the learning curve at the same rate for homework one. And then homework one itself, tuning matrix multiply, that's posted on the website. Uh, I think the current due date we're proposing is February 19th. And then uh, at that point, the, uh, the GSIs will take all your data and we'll take your programs and benchmark them, and we'll see who wins the race. Uh, and we'll compare you all. You're racing not just to one another, but you'll be racing compared to uh, the vendor blahs, and we'll see what happens if anybody beats it. So finally, there's lots and lots of reading and on the website, and uh, you can just read this you know, at your leisure. So that is really the end, then, of Lecture 2. Yes. With the reading, like, is it, should we do all of that reading? Sort of one yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is background. There's, there's more here than you really necessarily need to read. The reading that, that might be most useful for homework one is that there's stuff on the particular software tools that you will be using and what the, how the compiler works and you know, how the different uh, uh, tools uh, for measuring performance work. So you might want to look at that you know, sooner, uh, just in particular for homework one. But I will be making a lot of reading suggestions, and you can pick and choose depending on your own interest. And we can talk about it more in office hours if you want guidance. OK. OK, so lecture two was about you know, what do you need to know about hardware and performance on a, of, a, of a single processor, memory hierarchy, stuff like that. Now I'm going to talk about what parallel machines really look like. And so I'm going to give you a high-level description of how all those sequential processors that I told you about are glued together to form a larger parallel machine. And what are the programming models? You know, what are the high-level ways of thinking about programming them? And so here is the list of different kinds of models that are commonly available that people use to connect together a lot of sequential machines. And so there's shared memory, so where everybody can access, you know, every, all the data looks local to everybody. There's shared address, and the hardware does that for you too. There's shared address space, which from a programmer's point of view looks just like shared memory. Variable i is shared by everybody, but the hardware works differently underneath, and you'll see that in... Uh, in, in the hardware. The next, and these are generally smaller machines, right? Because it's hard to have, give everybody a global view of all the, all the memory. If you want to get bigger machines, you have to go to something called message passing. That's where every processor has its own private memory. And if two processors want to communicate with one another, they have to send one another messages. You know, so it's like the post office or something like that. So in order to you know, get data from one processor to another to get the computation done. And this scale, and the largest machines in the world uh, look like this. They, you, know, that, you can scale that up kind of arbitrarily. Um, then there's data parallel. And so maybe the canonical example today are GPUs. So one instruction will do you know, an enormous number of you know, multiplies at the same time or adds at the same time, provided you get all the data lined up in the right place at the right time in order to do that. Uh, in, the, in the old days, vector machines were the common example. But today, your laptop may very well have a GPU in it, which, which does this. Um, then 
really, really large machines are built out of clusters of all these things. As I mentioned, you may have shared memory processors or GPUs or some combination of them all glued together, sending messages to one another. In other words, your machine is hierarchical. So at the top level, it's sending messages. At a lower level, it's sharing memory. And at some other level, it's doing data parallel. So it's a heterogeneous concoction of all these things. And those are painful to program, but people build them because those are the biggest and fastest machines. That's what, and people want that. And then finally, there's all the computers in the world connected over the internet. And uh, if, if you're interested in looking for aliens, for example, uh, SETI at home does it, works that way. You know, all you can sign up to have download sequences of, of uh, signals from radio telescopes, and you can look for the aliens in your particular sequence, and you can fold proteins that way. And anyway, that's a yet another model of, of uh, parallel computing. And, and maybe that's the biggest one in some sense of you know, total number of flops available. So these are the, this is what the hardware looks like. Now the question is, how do you program it? That's the programming model. And historically, they were very tightly coupled. When people built a new architecture, they may even have invented new programming language to go with it, to sort of match the hardware exactly. You can imagine that doesn't make users very happy, right? If every time a new architecture comes out, you have to change all of your software. And so today, portability is much more important. And so there are some standards, some standard languages and, and message passing libraries and, and languages that go along with all of these different models. It's still in a state of flux. There's a lot of innovation going on. But it is possible to write a parallel program today that you can be quite sure will run in a few years. Uh, maybe not as fast as you would like, but the language will, will not have changed. So here is a generic parallel architecture to think about. And I'm going to use this to, to sort of illustrate all those other different models. So I have a whole bunch of different processors, There's, which may have their own little caches, but they may be very small. There's some sort of network that connects everything. And then there are a bunch of memories, reasonably so large size uh, DRAM memories. So each of these is perhaps gigabytes. And somehow all of these need to be connected. And so the question is, you know, where is this memory? Is it you know, far away over the network, or is it really close to each processor? Each of these architectures will look different, so I'll talk about that. Um, and, and what does this interconnect network look like? Right? Can everybody talk to everybody at the same time? Uh, or is there some sort of interesting topology in here that only certain patterns of communication are allowed? All those possibilities arise in practice. So, so whatever your, connect, your parallel machine looks like, your programming model has to answer three questions. There are always these three things you have to do to write a parallel program. And so in those three questions, there are control, data, and synchronization. And so we should you know, organize our thinking about it that way. So control is about how do you create parallelism? How do you tell two processors or three or a thousand that they're going to do two or three or a thousand different things in parallel? And how do you, you know, instantiate that parallelism? Lang all, the, all these languages differ. And then how do you control the ordering that exists? How do you say that this has to happen before that, and then the third task has to wait for the first two to finish before it can continue? Right? All these different dependencies need to be expressed. So that's control. As far as data goes, the big question is what data is private and what data is shared? So imagine you write you know, for i equals 1 to n inside your loop, inside your program. You'd like to make sure that no other program can come along and change i in the middle of your loop. right? You'd like it to be private to your particular subroutine. But there's some other data that you want to be shared. right? Everybody wants to see the global data. And so you somehow need to say which is private and which is shared and have good control over that. And then also for the, for the shared stuff, you want to say, how do I share it? Right? Do I, do I, uh, is the if I have a variable and its name is s, is everybody who refers to s gets the same shared value? Or do I actually have to you know, put it in an envelope and mail it to somebody? You know, call a subroutine that, that sends a message. So it's like the post office. So that's the data communication. And then the last question that we have to answer, you know, no matter what the programming model is, is synchronization. How do we decide that everybody starts at the same time, everybody stops at the same time, or, you know, or I break up my processes into groups, and, and each, inside each group they have to synchronize and you know, agree on when they're finished or when they're going to continue. So, so that's synchronization. And to think about that, we have to say, what, are, what is an atomic operation? So that, that means that you know, suppose you have a line of code in your program which says s equals s plus 1. It seems like a, a very simple line of code. But you know, is the s on the left and the s on the right, what can happen in between? Right? You go to memory and get s, 
and then you add one to it and you put it back, can, are you guaranteed that nobody else can come and stamp on S while you're doing that? Some other processor can't change the value of S in the middle of that line of code. That would, if, if they can't, it's atomic. That means it's one big unit. You own S for the entire duration. Uh, some operations are atomic, some aren't. So, and we'll, I'll have examples to show you what goes wrong when it isn't. And of course, each of these things has a cost associated with it. We talked about memory cost before. <coughs> Um, and each of these things, synchronization, that's much more expensive than arithmetic. Moving data is more expensive. You know, and, and certainly creating a parallel task. All of these are much, much more expensive than the basic arithmetic that you do, and we have to be aware of that. Okay. So let me use a simple example. And all I want to do is compute a global sum. So I have, a whole I have an array of data that's spread out over the whole machine, A1, A0 through AN minus 1. And I want to compute some function of each array entry and compute the global sum. So let's just imagine how this would map to a variety of platforms. So, um, for example, does A start living in one single memory that, that everybody shares? Or if I have many processors and, and each one has its own individual memory, does each, is it partitioned? So, for example, if I have four processors, does each processor get one quarter of the entries of A and which quarter of the entries? Then I have to decide, of course, which processor is going to do which work. And then I have to figure out how do they get to agree to come together to compute one sum that's correct, this whole sum. And so the simplest <laughs> way to, to do it is that here's my array A. It's obviously, in, in parallel, I can compute F of A for all of these different entries. Each of those function evaluations can be done in parallel. But then there's got to be some coordination to get the global sum. Okay? So let me just imagine how this would work in, a, in programming models. So I'll pick the simplest one first. So shared memory. Um, and so this is you know, what you might write on your laptop, which is multi-core. And so pthreads is, is, a, is a common example, or OpenMP. These are the names. Well, we'll, we'll have detailed lectures later on how you actually write the code, but these are examples. So in this case, what's the program in this shared memory programming model? It's a collection of threads of control. Think of them as a bunch of different subroutines. Each one is operating in parallel on a different core. And these, these can be created dynamically. In other words, you can have a main routine which calls a whole bunch of subroutines uh, and, and says, please execute them all at the same time. And, and so there's, there's a lot of ways they can be created. Now, once you start executing a thread, think of it as a subroutine, it's going to declare its own local variables. So that subroutine can say, you know, for i equals 1 to n over 4, its value of i is private to itself. Nobody else can see it. And for example, uh, in, in a language like C, it would be the local stack. But these, sub, these different threads, these different subroutines running in parallel, they also have to share the data. They have to share the array A, for example. And so how, does, how do you declare that in this programming model? Well, the main routine may have a, a declaration of, you may declare the array A in the main routine before you create the parallel threads. Those are called static variables. Then every subroutine that refers to A would refer to the same thing. If you're you know, more used to Fortran, you could have a shared common block. And, and if you malloc, you know, if you allocate uh, some data on a heap in the main routine and you send everybody a pointer to it, they can all look at the shared data on the global heap. So these are different ways you can have shared data. So how do threads communicate in this model? They do it implicitly by reading and writing uh, this shared data. Right? So if, if there's one variable, let's say the global sum, that can be seen by everybody, people can read it, they can write it, that's how they're going to do communicate. And they're going to coordinate by synchronizing on these shared variables. They're going to use this shared data to say, you know, how much progress have I made, am I done or not? <coughs> so here is a picture to have in mind for this shared memory machine. So imagine I have n plus 1 processors. So each of these boxes represents uh, one, of the, one of the threads it's running. Each one has its own private memory, so the locally declared variables. So each one has an i, its own loop index. So for in processor 0, when it refers to i, it may have the value 2. Processor 1, subroutine 1, can refer to the variable i. It may have a different value. That's perfectly fine. But then also there's this global shared memory that everybody sees. And so when each of these subroutines refers to the variable s, that is, it lives in shared memory, and it means the same thing. So in this so let's just imagine what happens when this processor executes, when processor 0 executes y equals s. 
where y is a local variable. That means it has to go into the shared memory, get that value, and bring it into its local memory. It has to get it, and it copies a value into here. And what if processor n does s equals something? Then it's going to take this value on the right-hand side, and it's go out, going to go off into shared memory and overwrite that value. So, that's, so all of them can see s. The value i can be independent for everybody. <clears throat> So let's ask ourselves how we would write that global sum in this, in this uh, programming language, or programming model. So I'm going to assume that I have a relatively small number of processors compared to the size of the array. And so it's worth using them all. And so I'm just going to give each processor a partial sum. You know, each processor is going to get n over p words to compute the function evaluation. And so what it's going to do without having to talk to anybody, so suppose I have you know, four processors, and I have 16 words. Each processor is going to get four of them. So it's going to compute f of, you know, a0, f of a1, f of a2, f of a3. That's what the first processor will do. And then it'll compute a partial sum. Each of these processors is going to sum up their local, local values. And then I have these four partial sums, and I have to add them up. So that's going to be the tricky part. How do I do that? So as I said, there's two classes of data, the shared stuff, which is everybody has to agree on n, everybody has to agree on the global sum. And then the, the private business is you know, all the values of f of a0, f of a1, and the partial sum. Right? So depending on where I declare them, I can either make it shared or, or local. So let's see what that code looks like and ask ourselves you know, what happens when we execute it. So here is a typical way you might write it. So let's suppose I just have two processors to keep it all easy. So here you would say, your main routine, so this is your main routine, it's going to call fork, and it's going to call a subroutine called sum. And the first time it calls sum, it's going to call it on the first n over 2 entries of the array. So this is going to sum the first n over 2 entries. And then the second line of code in your main routine is going to call sum again on the second half of the array. So I have two processors. Fork says, please go get some other processor to be busy doing this work. And then sum means I'll do it myself. OK, so at this point, I have two processors that are busy doing some work. So let's ask ourselves, so this is what you'd write at the high level. Let's see how this maps to the machine model. So here is the subroutine sum uh, for on, uh, applied to the first half of the data. Here's the subroutine, so that's this fork. And here's the subroutine sum applied to the second half of the data. <coughs> so there it is. It's perfectly reasonable. Everybody here is you know, computing f of a0, f of a1, and adding them to the sum. And this guy's doing the same thing. And the question is, what's wrong with this program? So this is, this is the most naive thing you could do. I claim it's terribly buggy. So we want to you know, think about why, what is wrong, what could go wrong with this. So we have a, a mental model of, of what the hardware is really doing, if you, if you were to write this. So suppose that this thread goes off and gets the value of s, and it gets s equals 0. And then this guy goes off, and he, and he gets the value of s, and he gets a copy of s, and says s equals 0. And then this guy finishes all his work, and he adds all, up all his work. And he, adds, he sums you know, the second half of the array, and he puts s back. So he does equals s. This guy, in the meantime, has been busy surfing a web page or something. You know, he's been busy, and only after this guy is finished does he come back, and he finishes his job, and he puts finally the answer back, and he's completely forgotten everything that thread 2 has done. So this is called a race condition. We have no, when you write this code, you have no control over what order these, these lines of code will be executed in. I mean, you know that this is going to be executed for i equals 0 first, then i equals 1, then i equals 2. This is a sequential program. It will run in the order you wrote it. So will this. But you have no idea how these lines of code and these lines of code are going to be interleaved. I mean, they could be, one could happen before the other. They could go like this. They could go like this. They're all possible. You have no control over that. And so you can get a whole bunch of different garbage answers. So let me look at a lower level to ask ourselves why that is. And so let me just assume now that I have just n equals 2, so I'm only trying to compute the sum of squares. Uh, and I'm, you know, f of x equals x squared, so I'm trying to compute 3 squared plus 5 squared. 
let's ask ourselves, what are all the possible answers this program could give me? So the lines of code that I started with was this. So let's just think you know, mentally, what does that turn into at the hardware level? So what, what is that line of code going to do? It's going to say, please go to <coughs> shared memory and get the value of s. Bring that from shared memory and give me my local copy. So the thread has its own local copy in its register. Then it uh, adds in f of a0, so it adds in 3 squared. And then it takes its value and it puts it back. Right? So this one line of code here, because you know, I, I equals 0, this is actually turns in this one line of code in C or Fortran turns into these four actual steps at the hardware level. You know, compute f of a0, get s, increment it, put it back. And thread two is doing the same thing. So this is what's actually happening. So let's just think about what numbers I could get. And so here is one possible execution order. So I'm going to so imagine so all these four have to ha happen in the order that you wrote them, that the compiler wrote them. These four have to happen in order. But now let me just try a particular interleaving. So suppose that line of code runs first. It goes and gets the three. It squares it. Gets a nine. Then suppose this guy is next. He goes and gets the 5, squares and gets the 25. Then this guy goes and gets s. s hasn't been changed yet. He goes and gets a 0. Then this guy goes and gets s. He sees a 0 also. Then this guy increments 0 by 25. So the local copy in my register, local data, is 25. And he puts it back. s is 25, sitting out in shared memory. Now this guy wakes up again. He's finished surfing the web. He takes his local copy of s, increments it from 0 to 9, and puts it back. So finally, when everything is done, the value sitting in memory at the completion of the program is 9. It's not you know, 9 squared plus, 20, plus 5 squared. It's not you know, 9 plus 25. And it's pretty easy to see that depending on the order, I chose an, kind of an arbitrary order, I could have gotten three different answers. I could have gotten either 9 or 25, or their sum, which is what I wanted, 34. So, so the point is that this is a race. We have to figure out how to program it to avoid this. And to think about it, what you have to know is what, are the, what operations are atomic? What can you believe happens all by itself that cannot be interrupted? So here, when I went to this, when I look at the original program, I can't think of this as all happening by itself. This can get interleaved with that one line of code. That is not an atomic operation. It starts and ends. Now, if I look at this, what I see is atomic oops, is reads and writes. When I, when I go to shared memory and get a copy of s, I get the value at some point in time. I get all the bits of an s. I don't get like half the bits or, you know, or something like that. I get a, in a copy of s at some stamp, standpoint in time. And this is atomic. It's all local data. I get the true sum of whatever's in that register and that whatever's in that register. And this write is also atomic. When, when I take my value of my register and go put it out in shared memory, I get whatever was out there. At some point in time, I'm guaranteed the value in memory will be whatever I had. I won't get like half the bits from thread one and half the bits from thread two. That's not how the hardware works. But you know, th that's all I can count on, right? That each of these very low level lines will happen you know, in, in one unit. And that's, so now, thinking about that, we can say, how do I actually get things to run correctly? And so here is an improved way to do it. So what I'm going to do is avoid as much communication as possible. That's the usual thing. So, I'm going to, so each of these threads is going to have a local sum. And so I'm going to take all it. So thread 1 is going to take all its data, all of its f of a0, f of a1, and add them into its local variable that only it owns. So there's no, nothing could go wrong here. right? It's all private information. And similarly, thread 2 is only going to add up its local data. And so now, finally, the true answer is supposed to be the sum of local S1 and local S2. So now I do have to do the sharing. And so here I do it. And so I have no problem with this. Local S1 is the true sum of the first half of the data. Local S2 is the true sum of the last half. And here, the same thing could go wrong as before. So the question is, how do I fix this? And the answer is, you need a new instruction that's in these languages, and it's called a lock. So what you do is you say, when I get to this particular line of code, I want to make sure that it's atomic. I want to make sure that only I get to touch S until it's completely finished. So I'm going to go into the room and lock the door behind me. And no other processor is allowed to follow me in until I'm done and I unlock the door again with that line of code. 
And whoever gets to the room first gets to lock it, finish their line of code, and then unlock it in somebody else's turn. And so that's a perfectly natural thing to do. And um, that fixes the problem to a large extent. So, but you may say, now, why did I bother doing it this way? Why didn't I just put the lock inside the inner loop? Why didn't I just do s equals s plus you know, f of this and s equals s plus and put the lock inside the inner loop? I mean, that would have been correct, but would have been, would have been a good idea. What? Because why would it have been a terrible idea? There's no parallelism whatsoever, right? Everybody has to take a turn one at a time. Only one processor is allowed to talk to S. And the process of locking and unlocking that door is like orders of magnitude more expensive than the ad that you're trying to do, right? So you want to do the locking and unlocking as seldom as possible. And this code does it exactly you know, once each, right? That's as cheap as it's going to get. So next time, we will I will tell you about what the hardware looks like that, makes this, that supports this programming model.